Welcome to Progenesis Academy webinar, session 38. Today's topic, biopsy or not biopsy. Today we are very happy to have a great panel of, of embryologists, lab director, who we're gonna learn from how they do the biopsy and what decisions they make when it comes to choosing the right time and the right embryo to biopsy. This webinar will be a uh, session of five to seven minutes power po uh, PowerPoint presentation. And at the end, we will have a uh, round table discussion. And let me introduce our panel. So we have with us, Dr. Anderson. He is the lab director at Aspire Fertility and EmbryoDirector.com. Dr. Weininger, he is the lab director at Atlantic Reproductive Medicine Specialist. Dr. Ivani, she is the senior um, uh, embryologist at Reproductive Science Center, the South, the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And we have Dr. Engel, and she is the lab director at Generations Fertility Center, University of Wisconsin. And finally, we have Dr. Session. He is the lab director at Reproductive Care Center. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Thank you. And uh, we get to start the first presentation by Dr. Weininger. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, really uh, look forward to hearing the other uh, presentations today. I always learn something from everyone in the field. Let's see here. So I just click it. Here we go. So our, the talk, of course, is embryo biopsy, when to proceed and when to draw the line. Uh, and as uh, was said, I'm at uh, Atlantic Reproductive Medicine in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, we, do, we do about 70 to 75% of all of our patients get biopsy, all ages, all numbers of embryos, we go from, uh, if a patient has one embryo and uh, makes it to blastocyst, a good blastocyst, we'll biopsy it. Sometimes we'll get uh, 20, 30 embryos, and we may have 15 or 16 of those that reach nice expanded blastocyst that we'll biopsy. So um, we do, all, as I said, all ages. We do uh, egg donors sometimes when um, we have multiple recipients and uh, they want to know the um, genetic status of their embryos. So uh, we, we pretty much do freeze-alls on everyone. We do very few fresh transfers. So um, said we do 75, 70 to 75% of biopsy or freeze-alls freeze with the rest of the patients. Um, other groups of patients that have uh, biopsies are uh, patients that did not have biopsy to begin with, and they have a good number of frozen embryos um, that they want to have thawed and have biopsies so they can have genetic testing performed. Most, most of these patients have had uh, a live birth and they want to come back for uh, a second child and they uh, want to make sure uh, they come back one time. So they want to, of course, transfer one blastocyst, which is what we normally do. 90, 99% of our, our, our transfers are single embryo transfers. So, so this is a, a fairly expensive procedure when patients uh, have to, uh, you do a thaw, uh, a biopsy, and a refreeze, so, and then the genetic testing. So that is a fairly expensive procedure. Uh, the others, we, you know, we would thaw and re-biopsy re due to uh, non-informative genetic results. And luckily we don't, you know, do not see a lot of those. Uh, we usually see, you know, three, 3%, three to 4% a year 
uh, no results or non-informative that we do, uh, we would thaw them out and rebiopsy them uh, to get uh, gen genetic results. Okay, so when do we do biopsy? We do, um, most, most of them are day five, uh, 55%. And uh, some of, most of them are in the afternoon of day five. Uh, occasionally we'll see some early, early in the morning that we'll biopsy, but, uh, you know, um, a lot of times we'll be biopsying you know, starting at one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock uh, to make sure that the embryos are uh, expanded enough, have enough trophectoderm cells and good ICM uh, to do the biopsy. So if they're not ready on late day five, of course, we go to day six and most of the time day six, we'll do the early biopsy. Um, so we, we, you know, versus a late day five, early day six. Um, so 40% of those are day sixes. And we do go to day seven. If we have embryos on day six that continue to, uh, that are progressing, uh, that have cavities um, and, but they're quite not, they're not there yet. We will go to day seven and look at them early day seven. And we are, we, we have done 5% do 5% day seven biopsies. So, um, but the day seven blastocysts have to be, have to be really good. Um, they have to be, uh, as I said, we'd like them to be four BB or better. Um, actually, they could be three, they could be three BBs, but you would, you would like them to be uh, a nice, nice trophectoderm. A lot of the day seven ones we see, um, don't have a, a good uh, trophectoderm. You can, you can see a, an ICM, and I'll, I'll have a picture of that later where we have a picture of the ICM, and it looks good, but then you scan up and down at the trophectoderm, and it's uh, very few cells. And really, when you, because of, the, of course, when you do the biopsy, you take the trophectoderm cells. So it's, it's great to, you want to have as many trophectoderm cells as you can uh, to do the biopsy. Okay, now, so these are the good blastocysts. These are the easy decisions here. Uh, as you see, uh, the nice uh, ICM here and here, and really good trophectoderm cells all the way around here. And same here, nice compact ICM. And this one is uh, being biopsied and you get the, you keep the ICM away from the biopsy pipette. And we do, uh, we do our, our hatching at the time of, of biopsy. So we would do a little hatching, little, little hole here at uh, very low uh, laser wavelength and, and uh, collapse the blastocyst, keep the ICM away over here and uh, just wait for it to, you know, begin collapsing uh, where we, you can really see the number of, of, of good, uh, good trophectoderm cells. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times you'll see these good blastocysts and um, you really don't know how what you're, you're gonna have until you do the collapse. Sometimes you'll see extra embryonic cells uh, that you don't really uh, recognize until you collapse the blastocyst. And you see all these cells out in the, uh, uh, between the blastocyst and the zona pellucida. So uh, we see that quite often. And uh, we, we try to remove those uh, the best we can when the, uh, the blastocyst collapsing. We'll, we'll take the biopsy pipette and remove some of those cells. So again, these are, these are nice, day, day five, two day fives and a day six. So, and again, these are really nice day five embryos. So these are some day seven embryos. These were uh, both biopsied and normal. Uh, so, 
you can see you see a good ICM. You still see some um, some good, you know, pretty good trophectoderm cells, but you kind of see some areas in here that uh, you kind of have a, a break in here that you don't see good trophectoderm cells. But there were enough that when you uh, got it, held it with the biopsy pipette, you get in here and, and get a good piece of trophectoderm cells. And this one was uh, this one was hatching on on day seven, and of course it came out of the zona as you were as we were biopsying it, and uh, you see a pretty good ICM in here. And this one had a good trophectoderm. So so these are are good day seven blastocysts. And like I said, we like to uh, biopsy those early in the morning on day seven if they're going to be biopsied at all. Now these are some uh, some ones we wouldn't biopsy. So, you know, when we draw the line on uh, biopsying, it generally has to do with embryo quality uh, and embryo stage. We like them to be uh, at least three, you know, um, three BBs. Three, you know, we we rarely biopsy. Uh, C embryos, but uh, uh, if they're two, uh, we don't have good luck if they're less than uh, a three expansion. Uh, twos, if they're on day five, we would definitely wait until day six for those. But these are these are some poor uh, day seven embryos where here's some of those extra embryonic cells I was telling you about. These these things are not inside of the the blastocyst proper. They're out in the, uh, between the blastocyst and the zona pellucida. So, uh, so we would, we would see that um, when, if we, if we were to collapse something like this, this is another one um, that you can see. We had a, there's a little, you know, ICM right in here, but it's just uh, not enough trof trophectoderm to go on with it. These are, I mean, these are days, these are actually day sixes. Uh, this is a day six. We gave it a DC. Uh, this is a day six. We gave it a four DC. And this over here, just multiple, multiple poor embryos on day six. So I have some other ones. So these are ones we wouldn't biopsy. And these are the day sevens. Um, this is the one of picture I was telling you about. Here we we can see a, a you know a, a you know fair ICM in here, but you can tell even from this image that there's not any trophectoderm here. And as you scan up, um, you can see how uh, there's there would be no way to biopsy something like that. Um, So, so then we'd give this one a, we gave this one a 4BD and uh, it was uh, not biopsy. Now, as I said, we do um, biopsy and hatching, you know, at the same time that um, we don't hatch, you know, beforehand. So this one, we would, again, uh, this is a video, but let's see if we can get it to start. Um, no, I need to go back. Let's see. How do we go back? And how will I start? Let's see. Maybe start. Do we do it here or how do we start the video? I don't think the video can be started because um, I received a PDF file instead. Okay. Sorry. I have it. I have it. I mean, I could play it, but on my, from my computer. But this basically shows uh, if it was a video, uh, which I wanted it to be, it, uh, it would show it collapsing. And uh, as I said, uh, poor blastocysts do not collapse well. Uh, and also, um, 
sometimes when you're when you're pulling the cells out you, they will tend sometimes they'll break the cells will break and if that happens on day five uh which we've seen you know every once in a while um as you're pulling it into the pipette and try to even before you start lasering the cells will break apart so what we would do we would just put that plasticist back in in culture culture until the next day and uh let it get a few more uh few more trophectoderm cells and we biopsy it again and they do a lot better uh the next day so we we've seen that you know every every once in a while we'll see that so again um at our at our center uh, the main reason we wouldn't do a bi a biopsy is because of, of poor poor blastocyst quality uh there are um you know we see we see c embryos that do uh improve uh if if one day if if it's a uh, four uh three b c and we give it uh, another day uh we we do we'll see it uh, sometimes they will in, improve and we just want to make sure that we uh, biopsy good embryos and uh, we just think that uh, uh, by doing that we have a, a better chance of uh, you want to make sure that they're going to survive the vitrification process. If you biopsy a bad embryo, your uh, the chances of it surviving vitrification and thaw are decreased. So we usually don't uh, do anything that we wouldn't normally vitrify. So uh, that's uh, that's all I have. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Session. Uh, thank you, Nabil. And thank you, David, for uh, your great presentation. I'm going to kind of uh, restart my video. Uh, so I'm going to do a little different approach, you know, kind of talking about some of the decisions that embryologists face when they're going about performing these biopsies. Um, you know, with us in our clinic here, we do about 30% of our cases are biopsy cases. Um, so we do it at a lower rate. Um, and then also, you know, we do assisted hatching on day three. And so uh, my pitch is going to be a little different. And then David's. But I kind of want to talk about, you know, how long, you know, we culture embryos. You know, do you culture out to day seven? Um, what are, you know, the minimum expansion grades and that would be needed to be able to safely perform that biopsy uh, to not damage the embryo. Um, talk about minimum expansion, also quality grades, and also other factors at play. You know, is it a, a convenient biopsy to perform, but might not necessarily give you a, a good sampling of the cells there? Um, or, you know, how much do the scheduling constraints impact our decisions as embryologists when we're performing those biopsies? If we have a busy morning are we going to be less aggressive or more aggressive um, or, or waiting later on? And even if you have too many to biopsy, I'll talk later. Um, I have some patients where they'll say, well, that, that's too many. I can't afford it. And then they're asking us to pick and choose which embryos to biopsy, uh, which, which I don't feel good about doing just because we know morphology doesn't exactly equal ploidy status. And also, you know, it's ultimately what the opportunity costs are in the decisions we make on when we perform those biopsies. I know, for example, here with, with number three, you know, obviously this is an early blastocyst and it's better to wait. You could probably pluck off a couple cells, but is it that in the best interest of the embryo um, for future use? Uh, and then you know, for day six here, you know, what about the quality grade? Is that good enough? Um, there is an inner cell mass hidden in here, but are there really enough cells there for you to be able to safely perform the biopsy? And if not here, do you feel comfortable about the quality of the remaining trophectoderm cells? Um, and then also here, you know, you, we've all been there where you put an embryo onto your um, biopsy dish and then you go put it on the microscope and it collapses on you. Now, is it safe to perform a biopsy? Do you know where the inner cell mass is and where, you know, how, how, how well did you remember the morphology of that embryo before it collapsed? Um, and, you know, where to draw lines? Obviously, what we know here with day three embryos, um, no, I don't know many clinics that biopsy day three embryos anymore. So um, they've kind of become obsolete just due to the safety 
And the benefit of doing it on day five, when you have more cells there, a, a better representative sample, and you're not removing uh, as such a large percentage of the developing embryo. Uh, now, a lot of it, we do a lot of our biopsies the morning of day five, um, but we will wait until the afternoon of day five if they are too early there in the morning. And what we find out is, you know, for um, survival and also implantation rates, the day five embryos perform better than day six embryos, which perform better than day seven. And I think, you know, would also be better than biopsying on day three. Uh, we don't do many day seven biopsy cases here. Um, our policy typically is, is if we can freeze the embryo, we will biopsy the embryo. And so we have a modified Gardner's uh, grading system. And so um, this embryo right here is an example of a recently biopsy day seven embryo. Um, it's not the best looking embryo, but it does meet our minimum criteria for being able to freeze it. Um, so when I say, now, are they worth it or not? In the last little while, we've biopsied less than 10 um, day seven embryos. All, all of those embryos have come back abnormal. And so we have not transferred any of them. But on the flip side, we do freeze some day seven embryos that we do transfer for a frozen embryo transfer. And we've had two babies born from those day seven embryos being transferred. Um, now a 33% live birth rate. And so now it, it goes to show that the embryos are viable uh, on day seven. And so if they do meet our criteria for freezing, then we will perform the biopsy. So as for the minimum grades, um, some ex we, we will do two through six, um, expansion grades two through six. Some of the twos, obviously we don't wanna wait a little longer, but every so often you'll get a two where it's just got two or three cells just um, sneaking out that you know, would do a, an optimum time to perform the biopsy, you'd be able to pluck them off. Um, and once again, I'm you know, talking here about the quality of the six, um, you know, is it safe to perform the biopsy? There is an inner cell mass in here, um, but the question is, you no, know, do you feel comfortable about biopsying the remaining? Um, and so, you know, we typically, we freeze good and fair embryos, and so those are the ones that we biopsy. Um, but then also goes into, you know, is there a sliding scale? You know, we are all people, we are all human. Um, are we affected by the number of embryos available to biopsy? Are we affected by the history of the patient and other previous outcomes? And even on the day of the biopsy, are, are we harsher on one day versus the other? Uh, Dean Morbeck's group has a bunch of papers out you now talking about the impact of embryologists you know, and, the, and the difference in our disagreements in grading embryos. Um, and it shows that we can be impacted um, by the patients, which I think is good. I think it goes to show that we do have the patient's best interests at heart. And we obviously want the best for them and, and to help them be as successful as possible. And now that goes into these other factors. Um, now, where do we draw the lines? Now, like for embryo number one here, you've got a couple cells peeking out here. You know, do we take the easy road and go in there and biopsy these loosely attached cells? You no, know, but do they give an adequate you know, representation of the ploidy status of the remaining embryo? And obviously this isn't a beautiful embryo, um, but there do seem to be some healthy epithelial cells there or trophectoderm cells there in the back, excuse me. And no, they would be a safe place to perform the biopsy. Uh, same for number two, you know, he's got this one cell plucking out. No, if we're under stress, scheduling constraints, a lot of do, our, our, our embryologist is going to take you know, the easy route and just take off this, this one cell. Um, no, but I, I think it goes down to opportunity costs. No, I think overall as embryologists, you know, we want to do what's best for the patients, what's best for the embryo. And I, I think that needs to play a lot into our decisions that we make, um, you know, as to what is best for the embryo and the future success of the patient. And so, you know, we're faced with these decisions throughout the day, but I think overall, you know, we do make the right decisions and know that this would all play into how we decide which embryos to biopsy and when. And that's the end of my part. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Engel. Thank you. Um, I run several labs, so it's difficult for me to give you just one approach to this, you know, to say my lab does this because I have a lab in California, a lab in New Mexico, um, a, a lab in uh, Wisconsin, a lab in North Carolina, and everyone does things a little differently. 
But I think there are some generalities that I can address. And so one of the easiest ways to be for me to approach this would be to say, take Dr. Weiniger's presentation and just say ditto. But there are a few things that we do do a little differently. For example, I have one program that does 100% of their their cases with uh, biopsy, 100% vitrification, 100% single embryo transfer. And it goes down to probably around the, the 60 or 70 in another program. So it's quite a, quite a, a wide variety here. Um, um, there we go. So what generally though do we do? Um, across the board, we will do days five, six, and seven under uh, certain circumstances for day seven. If it's obvious that all the embryos have stopped dividing, we're not going to culture to day seven. If there's still progress and we haven't had very many embryos to uh, vitrify, we will go ahead and take the embryos on to day seven. I have one program that has seen a number of pregnancies from these cases. So we always go to day seven in most of my programs if we possibly can. And we tend to not discard until we've gotten to that point um, that we really believe the embryos are no longer progressing. We will biopsy and vitrify anything from a 3AA to a 6CB. Um, or we, we really do anything that uh, has a nicely expanded cavity and looks like we can get enough cells out of it. So we will do uh, cells that or embryos that have a grade C trophectoderm. We would prefer to have a grade C trophectoderm, but a B inner cell mass. If we're going to take a C inner cell mass, we would prefer to have a B uh, trophectoderm. So we don't do very many CCs. And I think part of that depends on your, your grading scale, because usually for most of us, if we have something like a four or five or six CC, that is a pretty poor quality embryo. So again, we would come back and say, we do the same thing that other speakers have said, if we have something we would freeze, then we would biopsy it. And this is just some, some other examples of embryos that, uh, for example, this one does not have much of a trophectoderm. We would call that a C trophectoderm, but we would still go ahead and biopsy that. This doesn't have a great trophectoderm either, but there are cells in there. We would, we would biopsy that. This doesn't have a huge inner cell mass, but we would biopsy that. So we're, our goal is to get something to transfer for the patient. What else do we biopsy? We will follow embryos from you know, fertilization. And a lot of people may disagree with some of these, but we would, if we saw an embryo that started as a 1PN, so it had one pronucleus, but it had two obvious polar bodies and it went on to become a good quality blastocyst. And we knew we were going to do PGTA on this embryo. We would biopsy it and we would freeze it. We would do, uh, we would go ahead and do 2PN with any number of polar bodies, including completely fragmented polar bodies. So we really couldn't make an assessment about how many it had. And again, uh, we will do 3PN embryos if we're going to do PGTA on these embryos. So we'll, we'll take just about anything except maybe uh, M1 and GV, those very immature eggs. We will take those though. And we, in one program, we have one program that gets a lot of GVs that we culture and we will do uh, ICSI on them on day one, and we take them out to day seven pretty routinely, and we get pretty, we get a significant number of blastocysts, and we have had a number of babies born from that. Now, this doesn't happen with every patient. If we see that patient who comes through who has primarily GV eggs, we will we'll culture, we'll, we'll um, ICSI on day one, and we will take out to, to day seven, definitely. And we have had occasions where we've gone to, um, to day eight for these late dividing and late developing embryos. 
Um, what don't we biopsy? Generally, we don't biopsy um, embryos that are all CC unless there really is at least some sort of visible ICM. We would not do a three, uh, we would not freeze or, bi well, we would biopsy, but we would not freeze. Um, we would freeze if we biopsied, but we would not just generally freeze an embryo if we knew we weren't going to do biopsy on it for a 3PN or a 1PN, if they a 1PN without polar bodies, unless the patient was doing PGTA along with that, just because you know, we do view them as risky embryos to transfer. We think that doing a biopsy in general does not have a, a major negative impact on the embryo. So we certainly, if we had 3PNs or 1PNs, uh, we would prefer to be able to do a biopsy on those if we get good quality embryos so we get um, a result back. So it's not, the major embryos we don't biopsy are those embryos that just simply stop dividing and we don't get a, a blastocyst that we can get into at all. And I think that is the end, thank you. Okay, let's see. Am Thank you I so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Ivani. Okay, um, are you um, uploading the, am I able to, okay, start my video. Um, well, thanks to Nabil and to Riley for uh, inviting me to speak with this excellent panel of people. Um, this is a great topic and we were just talking about this uh, the other day in the lab about where to draw the line when it's time to biopsy. Um, I don't see that, okay, never mind, here we go. So um, before we talk about biopsying, I just wanna give you a little bit of background about our program. Similar to Dave, we do um, about 75% of our cases are PGT and we started biopsying around 2003. And you can see in, 2000, in 2020, we did 1,536 retrievals and that ended up being about a little over 5,000 embryos that we biopsied last year. So personally, I love biopsying. It's one of my favorite things to do in the lab. And uh, which I guess is good because we do a lot. So we, we've been through with the other speakers, the, the easy biopsies. Would I biopsy these? Sure, I would biopsy all of these. We are a program who hatches on day three. And so we often see these embryos extruding trophectoderm cells on day five. We typically are finished biopsying and by about 10 o'clock in the morning on any day, whether it's day five, day six, or day seven. We prefer to biopsy on day five. We do have higher euploidy rates and higher live birth rates if the embryos were biopsied um, and vitrified on day five. But as we know, that's not always the case. So we will go to out to day six and on rare occasions, day seven. So these are kind of no brainers. We would biopsy these. But when you get to the embryos that aren't so great, like the previous speakers have mentioned, you're making decisions. And we use a modified Gardner's grading scale. And, you know, Dr. Sessions, he really hit the nail on the head for us. I feel exactly the same way. We're embryologists, we're humans, we're making these decisions every day. And we have to use our judgment, what's best for the embryo and what's best for the patient. So, you know, the embryos, with the exception of probably the top row in the middle, which I think is way too small, uh, I would biopsy these embryos. In fact, I did biopsy these embryos, but they're not that great. And so, you know, playing off of what Dr. Sessions mentioned, are we really being objective? So we say we have a grading scale and it's, you know, it's a 3AA or a 4BB, but look at all these other things that come into play and I am guilty as charged of all of these. So. The age of the patient, the day of the biopsy, if a patient had 
you know, 12 day five embryos that were beautiful yesterday and she has some not so great embryos today on day six, am I gonna biopsy all of those embryos knowing that they're probably aneuploid, A, and B, that they're probably never gonna get used because she's gonna get pregnant from her E set of her nice day five ones. Um, the total number of embryos available may weigh into it. A history in a previous cycle, both with number of embryos and the ploidy. So if she had, you know, if this is her third cycle and she had no embryos to biopsy on three previous cycles and now she has these so-so embryos, um, I'm more likely to biopsy them than if she had nine good ones biopsied already and these leftover ones weren't so great. Um, I think the embryologist skill level may come into play. You know, most of the people listening here are probably quite skilled at biopsy, and I'm pretty confident that I could biopsy just about any of the embryos that we saw. Might not be the right thing to do, but if somebody is not confident in their biopsy skill, are they going to biopsy an embryo that they're not sure that they might actually cause harm to it? I think there are grading inconsistencies like we talked about. So all of these things do come into play and they do influence our decisions about whether or not we're gonna biopsy the embryo. So I don't really think that we're as objective as we could be. So I would say there's really two easy guidelines and this was um, alluded to a little bit earlier. Would I freeze this embryo if I was not biopsying it? If I was not gonna biopsy this, would I say this was a good embryo to freeze? And even more importantly, because we've all been in these situations where you get an embryo that's a no call, and then you have to thaw biopsy and refreeze it. If this embryo I'm looking at right now resulted in a no call, would I be able to thaw biopsy and revit this embryo? If you can clearly say no, then you might not want to um, go ahead and proceed with biopsying this. So let's talk a little bit about day seven. Now, um, why are we uh, this big push about going to day seven? I think in some programs, they're really, really large programs where they're doing retrievals at seven o'clock in the morning and they're doing retrievals at five o'clock in the afternoon. Then a day seven is not really a day seven. It might really be a day six and a half for their really long day. Um, in those cases, yeah, it probably makes a lot of sense to go out to day seven. Are you going to day seven to try and salvage something from the cycle because you are hoping for a better outcome than you got? Um, are you going to day seven because your culture conditions are resulting in slow growing embryos? I think you really need to think about why are we going to day seven? So we have done a minimal amount of day seven culture um, between January 2018 and January, this January, we cultured 150 patients out to day seven. So 68 of those patients had 93 usable blastocysts on day seven. That's not great blast conversion. Um, 58 of those patients were PGT and 73% of those embryos were aneuploid. So if you think about how many patients aren't gonna make it. And then of the ones that do, 73% of those are aneuploid. We did four FETs with PGT. There was one live birth, um, one un ongoing pregnancy, one biochemical pregnancy, and one negative pregnancy. So if you're that patient who has the ongoing pregnancy or the live birth, of course, it seems like the best idea ever to do it. But um, as far as doing widespread, we, are not really on board with this. And so we came up with this little plan here for who's gonna to go to day seven. So we really decided we were only gonna do this in PGT patients. So does the patient, and this again, some of the earlier speakers talked about this a little bit, is the embryo a 1BB or better on day six, which means it is making an effort, it is progressing. So yes, we would go to day seven on them. Um, did you biopsy one or two embryos on day five or day six? Yes. If we biopsied nine embryos on day five or day six, we're probably not going to go to day seven because they're never going to get used. They're going to sit in the tank and collect storage fees or be abandoned. Um, 
knowing that the patient really only needs one or two or three nice quality embryos from day five or day six, and really doesn't need suboptimal embryos on day seven. So we just actually last week put this together and we're gonna start using this kind of as an algorithm to decide whether or not uh, the patient would go, to, um, would go to day seven or not. And so here's what we're looking for. So they're gonna be a PGT patient where at least a one BB on day six, which means the embryos are trying, they're growing and um, fewer than two embryos biopsied already and frozen on day five or six. And that is it. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll look forward to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Anderson. Everybody, thank you for. Uh, I'd like to thank Nabil and Riley for uh, for being here. Um, the invitation. Uh, it's always a great uh, topic. Blastocyst biopsy. Um, I think you know. I take something from everybody's presentation. One of the things I love is that uh, uh, Marlene talked about doing the uh, the day threes, uh, not the day threes, but the three PNs, one PNs. Uh, that's something I just started this year. I don't really have any data on that, but I have started growing those out based on some of the abstracts I've seen uh, at ASRM, where some of these embryos actually do become euploid and possibly transferable after uh, doing PGT. I'm trying to see the, uh, the advancement here. You go to the next slide. Um, just as we've seen in all the other embryos, with all the other uh, presentations, we uh, we know what a good embryo looks like. And uh, as uh, the other speakers, and um, I like the way Kristen put it, uh, if you would you freeze the embryo, then you know, then that would be an indicator that it's qualified for for biopsy and. So uh, when you look out on the internet and people are posting pictures on social medias, we always post our good pictures, but none of us ever really focus on any of the, uh, the poor quality embryos and, and what happens with those. I saw a great presentation uh, earlier this year where um, CC embryos, looking at CC embryos, comparing those to some of the mosaic type embryos and that the mosaic embryos actually have better pregnancy outcomes than the CCs. So, you know, you know, all my uh, great peers uh, presenting today doesn't look like they're doing those CCs and uh, nor do I. Go to the next slide. One of the things I've noticed uh, when I work with other, lab, other labs, um, I am a multi-site lab director. I actually, and I'll go into other laboratories and help them out whenever they need some help. And, so a lot of inconsistencies in the nomenclature we use. Um, um, I follow uh, gardeners. I think uh, uh, Kristen said she uses a uh, modified gardeners. Um, I just kind of follow what, what gardener has. I uh, the one through five, six, uh, you know, one being the earliest. Um, the only thing I will biopsy are three and a better. Um, and uh, A's and B's is what I focus on. I don't grade anything after a C. I, uh, I had, we hired a doctor one time in our program that asked me why I didn't biopsy the C grade embryos. And uh, the program she had come from, um, they actually graded embryos with a, a, a further out to D, E, and F. And so um, there's some, some inconsistencies, especially when we're transferring embryos around to from program to program. It'd be nice if we all 
spoke the same nomenclature. So I'm going to go to the next, next slide. So one of the things I noticed early on when I was, uh, when I, before we were ever doing blastocyst biopsies, we, um, the very first 10 frozen embryo transfers with blastocyst I had, I had no pregnancies. And I always share this story with people, especially when they're learning to do things in the laboratory, because if you failed at something 10 times, would you keep doing it? And uh, fortunately we did. And you can see where we're at today. We basically freeze all of our embryos a lot of times. And so um, we, we, I learned that in order to have good pregnancy rates with embryos, you had to have good quality embryos. All the things we've talked about with the other speakers, the A's and the B's, um, those are great quality embryos. Those early embryos that I was freezing, if it had a cavity, I was freezing them, come to find out they were probably suboptimal embryos. Once I knew I was freezing the right embryo, pregnancy rates were, were quite good across the board. I don't do day sevens in, in our program. Um, I, I, you know, if you looked at uh, Kristen's numbers, I had a very similar uh, experience. Before I was doing blastocyst biopsies, I actually did day five and day six trans uh, using and had great results. I thought, well, let's go out to day seven, uh, maximize the embryos. And after I transferred a hundred of those embryos, I only had one uh, pregnancy and one baby come out of it. And so um, at that time, it was probably around 2004, I abandoned day sevens and haven't tried it since. And so Kristen's numbers are probably the first time I've actually seen numbers that are you know, solid on, on what's happening with the day seven. So I'm excited to see what happens in the future. So much like all the other speakers, would you biopsy? And at the end of the day, uh, I would biopsy both of these embryos. And, uh, and so um, we'll go to the next slide. Um, it gets a little more challenging. This is, a, this is an example of, you know, would you biopsy? I actually use a lot of these embryos to, uh, to train embryologists when I'm doing the biopsy training, you know, to give them an idea, to build a library of uh, what would you biopsy, what wouldn't you biopsy. And so uh, the one on the left, I would, I would biopsy. The one on the right, this is a type of embryo, if it was on day five, I would give it a few hours and uh, let it culture. And on the morning, I would go to day five, I would let it culture for two or three hours in the afternoon. I think David mentioned that he um, does a lot of his biopsies, 55% of them on day five. I try to maximize my day fives as well. And we'll go into the afternoon if I, uh, if I have to on some of my embryos like this on the, on the right side. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, here's another example, the embryo on the left, I'd probably let that one grow a little bit. You can see the inner cell mass growing down there at uh, around seven o'clock, but uh, give it a few more hours, it might be good. If it's still not ready, getting a nice uh, uh, herniated uh, set of trophectoderm, then I would let it go to the next day. Um, and then the one on the, on, the, on the right, if this was day six, I wouldn't biopsy that embryo at all. Um, on day five, I'd go ahead and let it go one more day, but um, um, at, this, at this time, it's not ready to biopsy. So go to the next slide. So uh, I love these embryos because uh, I get a little mixed bag of, uh, of um, responses. Everybody agrees, the embryo on the right, you know, we've seen other pictures very similar to this. Uh, the embryo on the right, obviously not biopsy. You can see where if that was the inner cell mass, it's necrotic. Um, you can actually count the cells. You can, the way I, I'll describe it is you'll, you can go from one point to, from point to point and actually see the, um, uh, count the cells in between there. And so you're not gonna, you know, you can have an inner cell mass that becomes a baby and you're not gonna have a uh, uh, nice trophectoderm implant in the uterus. Now the embryo on the left, um, we get a mixed bag. Some people will say they will, some will say they won't. This is a hatched embryo. It's out of the zona. So, you know, we'll, we'll assume it's a day six. Um, you do have an inner cell mass over there at, at nine o'clock. Um, so about 50, 50 say they will, 50, 50% 50 say they won't. So, uh, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, these are some embryos that are very much like, uh, some of the others, but 
not ready to go right now. Let it go, uh, you know, till the next day. And uh, you can see an inner cell mass forming on the right side, uh, right embryo, um, but it's just not quite ready. Um, you know, if these were hatched or hatching, I still give it a little more time. This, this is, uh, these are probably more in the like the if you're doing the gardener grading scale, a one or a two, and just give them a little more time. The next slide. And I uh, thought I'd leave you with a beautiful blue bonnet and thank uh, everybody for coming today. Thanks, Tony. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, let's uh, launch the poll. Um, Riley, if you could uh, get the poll out so we can get some uh, responses from, uh, from the embryologists. So the question I have for you guys um, is uh, the first question is regarding the impact of biopsy on embryos. So we, we've seen a, a few studies that don't show really a significant impact on in terms of, you know, uh, clinical pregnancy and, and del delivery. It, basically, there is no obvious um, impact on embryos uh, as far as literature. But when it comes to embryos that are poor quality and um, and not as uh, you know uh, good to to biopsy, what do you guys think? Do you think that if you take into the consideration the quality of the embryo, um, is there any impact on on the it does does biopsy impacts the integrity of the embryos? And I'll start with you, uh, Marlene. I think you're muted. How about that? Oh, fantastic. I, okay, I think if you have a poor quality embryo, the problem that occurs is when you go to do the biopsy on it, it just kind of falls apart on you for the most part. And so I, I definitely think with poor quality embryos, it can have a negative impact on them. But um, we see I, the numbers I've run have said in virtually all my programs that we see greater than 98% of the embryos that look like they're surviving. So they have their, they are, they re-expand, their cells look intact and they do very well after transfer. So generally I have no reservations whatsoever about A, freezing embryos and B, biopsying and freezing biopsied embryos. So I think it's, um, I think the thing that's become hardest for most embryologists has been, um, you know, for us, it's the what to do with the mosaic and the, the aneuploid embryos. You know, do you, do you transfer yeah. once you get those results back? But when you look at a poor uh, quality embryos, uh, in combination of the skills of the embryologists, does it is it is there any risk that certain embryos would not be handled as uh, you know well as with embryologists that have more experience um, that that is add a little bit more risk to to the embryo? Well, obviously, I think we all want to make sure we've got our embryologists trained before we turn them loose on patient samples. And that's the whole point of training. Yeah. Kristen? I'm sorry, the phone's ringing in my house. Oh. Um, I would agree. Why not here? I'll mute and go on to somebody else. <laughs> yes, yes. I will, I will take David. David, are you there? Maybe he's not connected. Uh... Okay, sorry, I'm back. Yeah, um, I'm here. Sorry about that. So I would agree with Marlene in that um, in a, with a trained person, I am completely confident that we are not doing harm to the embryos. And as she said, I think it's evidenced clearly by embryo survival rate when we um, thaw them and also pregnancy rate. And even when we do thaw biopsy revits, either on embryos that had no call or oftentimes patients, I think Dr. Sessions brought the, or um, I think Dr. Weininger brought it up, patients who come back who, and, and wanna test their untested embryos for uh, whatever reason. 
those embryos do generally vary very well. And so I, I'm really not concerned about the biopsy. And when we are training embryologists, they generally will start with the worst quality embryos that are day eight or nine or 10 mm -hmm. that have been sitting in the incubator. And that's how they learn how to biopsy on embryos that were going to be discarded and then eventually will work their way up to, you know, patient embryos who they donated their embryos to training in the lab. And so they get to work on better quality embryos. So by the time somebody actually is doing live patient embryos, they're really quite skilled. Thank you so much. One of the questions we received in the chat is whether uh, it's a good idea to biopsy a zero PN, zero PN no fertilization, um, if that embryo makes it to an embryo. And I think in the presentation also, you guys mentioned 3PN, that sometimes you do biopsy 3PN. Uh, David, can you elaborate on your position on this? Yes, we, uh, we biopsy, uh, we watch, look at polar bodies. So if we have a, a 0PN with two polar bodies, we will uh, check it later in the day and to see if it goes to two cell, to see if it, uh, uh, fertilized earlier and the PNs were gone. So that we will culture on. Uh, we will culture if you know, all this is uh, if we're doing biopsy. Uh, we'll do one PNs, we'll do three PNs, uh, all of them. We'll keep, of course, keep them all in separate drops and keep up with them. Uh, but uh, we will do all of them if, uh, as long as we're doing biopsy. We don't do that uh, if we're just doing a freeze all on a patient. We want to make sure we get the genetic uh, makeup uh, before we uh, would freeze embryos on a patient like that. But we do have good, uh, uh, there was a patient today that uh, was a 3PN that uh, on day, it was a day six, it, it was hatched out. It was a AA, looked great. So I biopsied it and we're going to be sending it. Thank you so much. Um, ben? Yeah, no, we're kind of similar. Um, we did a short, I guess, small study here in our clinic, culturing out the zero PNs um, and the one PNs and two PNs, and, and we didn't have any really good results with the zero PNs. We biopsied them. Um, everything we sent in came back abnormal, um, so we discontinued that practice, but we do culture out the one and two PNs, um, and we do biopsy them and, and, and do see good results with them. The majority of the one PNs come back as normal, and so we do culture those, and similar to what David said, we keep them separate in the embryo culture dish and track them throughout. And they, um, even them with a non biopsy patients will hold on to the one PNs. Obviously they're prioritized last when it comes to the embryo transfer. Um, but we, we, we do biopsy, you know, see good results with those being biopsied. Ben, just, could I ask when you do your FERT checks? Um, we do them between 15 and 17 hours post fertilization or post ICSI. Yeah, I was talking to Dean Morbeck a while back and he was saying he had an instance where um, he was asked to come into a lab. So he didn't get in there till about day, about hour 20 and had a lot that didn't have PNs, but they kept them. And the next day he had a number of, of embryos that were dividing and went on to form nice blastocysts. So in a circumstance like that, would you throw the zero PNs or not use the zero PNs? No, I, I would definitely hold on to those. You know, if you're doing a fertilization check that late, um, you, the good chance you are going to miss them. Now, even what we see with time lapse imaging, some of them even, you know, some of the pronuclei form and disappear even before the 15 to 17 hours. Um, I don't have the luxury of a of a time lapse system here in our clinic, um, so we we narrowed it down to the 15 to 17 hours. Um, we've had good results. We've hung on to those um, that we didn't see the the nuclear formation and um, they really didn't develop and they, they remained you know, unfertilized. And so we, we stopped doing that practice. Thank you so much. Uh, Tony, what's your policy in regards to um, biopsy in, uh, in this situation that we are discussing right now? Um, my experience is actually just the opposite of doctor sessions. Like when I see zero twos, I culture them separately, just like uh, um, we were talking about, but um, I actually kind of stumbled into this accidentally several years ago. I had a, a patient at 16 oocytes. It said only eight fertilized. Um, I was training somebody later in the day, saw that they were early cleaved. 
Um, and so I cultured them out. Um, uh, somebody happened to transfer that embryo on Saturday and wrote a case study on it. So I've been culturing zero twos for a long time and actually find that they're my better embryos. Um, because I think that because they just, you know, they're just ready to go They're the, the pins are there and gone. And the way Marlene said, I, we, I'm usually at around 18 to, you know, 19 hours when we look at, I always say, say the reason why we do, uh, uh, ICSI at one or two o'clock in the afternoon is so that we can check FERD at 18 hours the next morning. Um, if I wasn't going to check FERD, I'd probably just do ICSI at nine o'clock in the morning and, and just let them grow. Um, in fact, the way we're looking at some of the three PNs and uh, one PNs, I, there was actually an article in Burton Sturt here recently. Uh, I believe Kevin Duty wrote it on about not checking fertilization anymore, just kind of proposing that. And if the doctors didn't want to know what the fertilization was, I probably wouldn't check for it, especially if I was doing uh, PGT. Because it's going to tell me what is normal and not normal at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Uh, when, it, when it comes to uh, biopsying on day seven, um, Kristen showed some data showing 73% uh, aneuploidy rates. Um, what are your, what's your guys' experience as far as outcome when it comes to biopsies on day seven? And I, I can take the first, uh, maybe Marlene, if you can tell us about that. Yeah, we've definitely had normal embryos and babies from them. So that's why we continue to do it. I mean, I don't know, I don't know my exact number. I don't have a, um, a nice solid number. You know, when you direct a number of programs, you don't always have easy access to the the databases when you would like to have it. Um, so I don't have a, a hard and fast number for you. And I would, I would definitely agree though. I think the the ploidy rate, the euploidy rate is lower, but we definitely get euploid embryos and we definitely get babies. Thank you so much. Um, David. Yeah, I agree. The uh, euploidy rate is much lower. Uh, but we we have we do have some babies from day sevens, but uh, I do like Kristen's idea about the, looking at the number of embryos that are frozen to decide whether to you know to go to day seven. So um, I mean I think when we're doing a lot of day fives and day sixes and and whether or not we get our day seven or not, uh, I, I agree that. Uh, they would be the last ones to be used. Uh, it would be only if you only had like one embryo on a day six that was biopsied. If a patient had a low number of embryos and one was continuing on uh, to go to day seven, but uh, we do have some, you know, we have some some nice embryos that make it, you know, on day seven that we that we've uh, biopsy and uh, they come back normal, but uh, at a much lower rate. Uh, and we do have, as I said, we do have some pregnancies from that group, you know, albeit much lower than day five or day six, you know, day five, the best, of course. Very good. Um, I'm going to ask Ben first uh, to give us his uh, uh, you know, perspective on day seven embryos, but we have some data also uh, on euploidy rate that we'll share with you guys. And Riley, if you can post that after Ben's response. Uh, ben? Sure, no, we're, we're a smaller clinic. Um, we have biopsy day sevens. We haven't had any you know, normals, and I'm talking less than 10, um, but we do have pregnancies transferring day seven untested embryos. And if the embryos are still developing, still growing, we're gonna culture them to day seven. We're gonna give them every chance. I mean, it boils down to, you know, if it meets our criteria for freezing, then we will perform the biopsy and freeze it. Uh, we want to give the chase. Now, even if it's a small 20% chance of a, of, a, of a baby being born, uh, we're going to you know, be willing to do that for the patient. Fantastic. Um, let's look at the data we have gathered. This is uh, taken from uh, a total number of more than 60,000 embryos. But basically what we have is on the left-hand side here, uh, we have um, day five embryos, all ages combined. So we're looking at 57.54 of euploidy rate. Then uh, the middle one is day six 
I don't know what that number is. It's a very small slide, but 48, I think. Right, Riley, can you read that for us? Um, and then on yes, the very... It's, sorry, it's 48.74%. 48, yeah. Okay. And in, on the very uh, right-hand side, you have day seven, and that is... Uh, 50, uh, 37% 37. for your point, yeah. Yeah, so about 10% difference between each... Uh, 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 you know, type of biopsy. Um, Tony, what's, uh, what's your program uh, when it comes to, like, what's your criteria regarding day seven? Um, based on my early experience with day sevens, uh, I'm not aggressive with the day sevens. I, as a rule of thumb, we culture, we will biopsy all day on day five. We don't care how late it is. Um, we try to biopsy our embryos before noon on day six, um, just like just because of some verbal conversations with 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 colleagues that implantation rates start going down after that time. But it's really dependent. Uh, I think it was Kirsten that said uh, that uh, you know if you're doing retrievals late in the day, is it really a day six or uh, day seven? But um, I did not have a lot of luck. Um, we do culture some out to day sevens, especially if, you know, just trying to maximize, you know, she's 42 and only one embryo just to see if we can get something. Um, I've never had anything actually grow out to day seven. So we, you know, good quality embryos. Um, I, just looking at your data there, though, it was interesting that the euploidy rates fall, but it looks very consistent with the mosaicism rates and uh, other, other, the other, like the smaller bars on your graph. It seems to be very consistent between day five, day six, and day seven. So yeah, I've never yeah. seen that before. So yeah, interesting. interesting. Very good. Uh, Riley, if you can get us the poll results to look at the feedback from the attendees. Perfect. So let me look at the poll. All right, so we have asked, uh, do you perform biopsy on day seven? Seven percent said yes. Fifty-nine percent said sometimes. Uh, seven percent said often. Fifty-nine sometimes, and thirty-four percent said never. So about the third of the uh, embryologists don't biopsy day seven. And we asked, do you perform a, a biopsy on day seven with a CC grade? And um, 4% said yes, 41% depend on the situation, 54% never biopsy a CC grade on day seven. And we asked, uh, what's your euploidy rate um, with day seven embryos? Um, they, I guess the question was day five versus day six. 1% um, said higher than day six. Day five, forty-four percent said similar, and fifty-four percent said lower. I think the data that we showed show clearly that there is a about ten percent difference between day five and day six. And so we ask, what are the key factors that are, uh, driving your decision to biopsy or not biopsy? Twenty-five percent said culture duration, fifty-nine percent embryo expansion, eighty-four percent said embryo quality. Then we have thirty-four percent that says the number of embryos per patient and 15 percent said all the above and uh two more questions number five we said how often do you biopsy uh, do your biopsy procedure occur occur on weekend 62 percent said very often 29 uh, occasionally seven percent said rarely and the last question which of the three following biopsies would you prefer a CC grade on day five, 6%, BC grade on day six, 63%, and BB grade on day seven, 31%. It looks like the majority would prefer to biopsy on day six, a BC, rather than biopsy on day five, a CC, or day seven, a BB. What do you guys think about this? What would you do um, if you have a choice between these three scenarios? And I'll start with you. David. I think I would go with the BC grade. I would, uh, I would go with day six over day seven. Okay. 
Kristen? <laughs> well, we don't biopsy grade C's. Okay. So, I mean, that would be an embryo that we would not, I, I mean, if it was with another cohort that was going to day seven, we would leave it for day seven, but we would not biopsy a C grade embryo. And BC versus BB, BC day six, BB day seven? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same embryo. So if it's a BC on day six, I'm not going to biopsy it. But if it went, if it was going to day seven, um, because it was a cohort that was going to day seven, yes, I would biopsy it on day seven if it were a BB. Okay. Yeah, it's a kind of interesting question because obviously it's not going to be the same embryo. But if you have two different embryos, one is a, a BC day six and the other one is a BB day seven, which one would you prefer? Well, we would biopsy the BB day seven because we would not biopsy a BC embryo. A BC embryo, okay. Um, ben? Uh, I'd align with David, I'd go with the BC on day six. On day six. Tony? Um, you know, one of the things that would be interesting to look at uh, is your data on the day five, day six, day sevens. Because everybody here reports lower euclid rates on day sevens. I answered this question, the BC on day six, because the euclid rates are higher, the implantation rates are higher with day sixes. So the day seven, that might be why I'm getting, I'm not really getting an embryos, anything I grow to day seven, because I, I just know the, the results are really poor. So I would do the day six. Very good. Marlene? Well, I would transfer both both the day six and the day seven, and I would biopsy both, but which would I prefer to do or which would I do preferentially? I, I, I said the BC uh, on day six, but I would still do the BB on day seven. Yeah, so you guys go rather with the grade than the age of the embryo in general, generally speaking. Right. Well, if I had to pick, I would go by the day for sure, but, yeah. you know, prefer to pick the, uh, by, by the grade of the embryo. I think one of the things that we need to be careful of with day seven is it might be increasing your, you, you know, what we call, <clears throat> excuse me, usable blast rate. Um, because we're using more blasts at the end of the cycle converted from two PNs, but are they really... Is it really helping the patient? I think is what we really need to keep in mind. Are we really increasing our pregnancy rates by doing this and, um, and helping the patient? Yeah, so the question that we ask about the key factors driving the decision to pick to biopsy or not biopsy, one of the, a third of the answers are on the uh, number of embryos available for patients. So if you have a lot of embryos you have that luxury to not biopsy certain embryos. Is it a consensus uh, among all of you guys? Would you do the same thing? Do you have lots of embryos? Well, if for our patients, it's part of their, um, their treatment order. So some patients, depending on which genetics lab they use, they may batch in groups of eight or 12 or something like that. And the patient may say, I only want to biopsy <clears throat> up to eight or up to 12. Um, but if they want to biopsy all of them, we would biopsy all of the embryos. All the embryos that we felt were good enough quality for biopsy, yes, we would biopsy all of them. Very good. But what is the most important factors that drive that decision in your- Embryo LPD? quality. Embryo quality. Mm -hmm. How about the rest of the panel? Um, David? Same, embryo quality. quality. Yeah, we would biopsy everything too. Uh, yeah, anything that's biopsial, we'll biopsy it. Yeah, if we had a patient who said, I only want eight biopsy, we would you know, preferentially biopsy first on day five, then on day six, so we'd get the best quality embryos on day five and then move to day six and look at them on day six until we got our eight uh, mm -hmm. embryo basket filled. But we would still freeze mm -hmm. anything that, uh, even if it wasn't perfect, 
on day six, and then we would probably go on to day seven, just because patients have been known to change their mind or not get pregnant with the first group. And because I've seen CBs and BCs give rise to pregnancies, and I've seen day sevens give rise to pregnancies and, and to babies. And so for me, I think it comes back to, you know, what, but well, this is gonna sound really harsh and I don't mean it to sound harsh, but you know, it's, what's a baby worth? Because to me, it's, I feel like it's up to me to do everything I can to get embryos for the patient. And then it has to come back to them to ultimately decide you know, whether they're going to keep them or discard or donate or do whatever long term, or whether they don't want to transfer. And so I just feel like it's my obligation to give them as many chances as possible. Thank you so much. So many of you have mentioned uh, in the presentations that if you cannot vitrify, you shouldn't biopsy. And how do you define those embryos that cannot be vitrified? Can you, can you guys give us some, you know, uh, uh, illustration of how that looks like in the lab? Uh, Tony, what, what, how do you define embryos that are not going to be vitrified? Um, well, in our, in our lab, um, a C grade embryo, a CC embryo, we would not vitrify. You could vitrify it. doesn't mean that you should vitrify it. Um, I will let it grow, as Marlene said, um, to see if it'll be a BB tomorrow. Um, if it doesn't, a lot of times they just stop growing. Um, embryos that look that are seized today might be bees tomorrow, and so we, we let them grow. That's and it's anything can be vitrified. You could, but it doesn't mean that it's going to survive and make a pregnancy. And you know, and it, it's not harsh to say, you know, what is it? you know, what is it worth? Because at the end of the day, we want to make babies, not just pregnancies, babies. Getting someone pregnant to only have them have a loss is not, is not a success. And so we, you know, we look at a lot of the statistics, you know, day five, day six, day seven. What is that costing? What is the dollar per baby take home baby? That's what, it, what it will, that's where we're going and that's what it's gonna come down to. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, ben, what's uh, what is your position on this? Uh, very similar, almost exact to what Tony said. Um, CCs we don't vitrify just because we don't think they'll have a good outcome, or they might not have a good outcome. They could be vitrified, but and we choose not to just because you no, know, we want to give the patient the best chance of success. Um, and so, no, we're very similar to what Tony practices. Yeah, same thing, David. Uh, yeah. I I feel the same way. I mean, you can vitrify, I mean, anything and, uh, but whether you should, uh, uh we, I feel the same way, just, uh, sees, uh, you're going to, whether it survives or not, and it gives the, the, the patient a good chance for pregnancy and delivery. That's what it's all about. So we just want to make sure that, uh, that we biopsy embryos that, uh, are going to, uh, vitrify well, give the uh, patient a good chance of pregnancy and and uh, and delivery, and just uh, that's why we very you know we tried to biopsy as many as we can on day five and then early day six. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that's that's how we are when we do freeze all patients. We do the same thing. Uh, we don't without biopsy. We we won't freeze, you know, lesser quality embryos. Uh, um, Chris and you have mentioned earlier a, uh, that you guys are working on an algorithm to automate the decision of whether to biopsy or not. Do you see that being a common practice in IVF centers, or do you think is, or is the, or you think that embryology will continue to use your judge, their judgments on a on a on a daily basis? <laughs> That's a great question right now, Nabil. I think there's a lot of interest and a lot of push toward automation of embryo selection. Um, and I think at some point, I, I think it, some people probably are using it quite extensively now, 
we do have an algorithm that was developed by our current lab director that that's just data from our program that <clears throat> if this patient is 35 and she has three embryos and she has a four BB, what are her chances of getting pregnant with that embryo? Um, you know, we do use that when we're trying to select, when the physicians are trying to select which embryos to transfer. Um, I, I like to think that our work is still important and our input is still, imp is still important to the field. And um, I would hate for us all here to be replaced by, uh, <laughs> by some AI machine. But, um, but I do think that we will continue to develop that and use that technology for sure. Uh, Marlene, what's your opinion on this? Uh, well, I certainly hope we continue. Uh, I mean, it's been a great career for me and it, you know, there have been so many times when I've gotten up and felt like I was going to work and, and doing valuable work for my, my patients. Um, and so I can't imagine, I, I really don't know how you can develop a system that, how you develop a clear cut algorithm that gives you a good enough predictive value. And let me, let me tell you what it comes down to. It's sort of the horns of the dilemma that I find myself in on all the time. And that's that I'm old. I started this in the 80s, the mid 80s. And I remember throwing a party for my lab when we hit 20% pregnancy rate. <laughs> and that was a big deal for us at UCSF in the, the mid 80s, a 20% pregnancy rate. And you know, when you think back to Steptoe and Edwards, you know, their pregnancy rate in the first few years was less than 1%. You know, uh, Louise Brown was the hundred and some transfer. And so when I look at when I look at pregnancy rates, it's just so hard for me to say what is a feudal pregnancy rate. I think ASRM defines feudal pregnancy rate as being 5% or less. And for me, if I have a category where I have a pregnancy rate that's 10% or more, I still think it's worth it to do because I remember those days when we celebrated every single pregnancy. And so to me, it's just really hard to think of giving up the emotion associated with it and letting an algorithm take over. That's a, a way to see it for sure. Um, David, what do you think? Automation or algorithms may be helpful or, sh or, or may take over when it comes to selecting embryos uh, for biopsy? Well, first of all, I don't see how it would work. Uh, 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 and I agree with Marlene. I mean, I've been in, in this since the 80s also, so it's, uh, uh, I enjoy, I enjoy what I do. And I just, uh, I, I think there'll be some parts of, of the uh, procedures that could be automated. I don't see a way that biopsy would ever be automated uh, except for, you know, spent media, uh, things like that. But uh, uh but but I'm not referring to the biopsy itself, just the decision whether you should biopsy an embryo or not based on what how many embryos you have and all the other parameters that you, that the that is out there. Mm -hmm. Well, I could I mean I could I could uh, I could see uh, something like that looking uh, at for uh, looking at the total number that are. Are biopsy and have fertilized, and how many go to blastocysts and things like that, and trying to uh, decide a number. I don't. Uh, I still think that it's going to be up to the embryologist to to look, and uh, uh, they're just so. Uh, it's just not a two D two D image. You know, it's just uh, you got to roll it around. Sometimes you don't think you see a good ICM until you. Uh, you roll it around or get it on the uh, holding pipette, you, uh, then you see a good ICM or you see parts of the embryo that you didn't see uh, just looking at it in the microscope, uh, 2D. So, you know, it's, I still think it, 
uh, there'll be some applications, but I think it may be a long time coming. Thank you so much. Uh, ben? Yeah, sure. Um, now, if you think about it, we all are computers or supercomputers, and we all kind of go through our own algorithm deciding which embryos to biopsy, which embryos not to biopsy. Uh, you know, and so I guess we're walking algorithms, if you will. Um, every little bit of data or any information we can gain that would help us make a better decision, I think is good. But at some point, you know, eventually you have information overload. You know, are you able to know which is beneficial in choosing which embryo biopsy versus not? Um, I think we're getting a better, obviously a better track record. We've come a long ways. You know, I, I haven't been this as long as others. And I, I thank you for the great work you've done previous or prior to me coming. But you know, I think we have a bright future ahead of us and you know, we can use the advances in technology to help us make better decisions so that we can help hopefully improve the patient outcomes. Thank you so much. Um, I have one more question, probably the last question as we are getting close to the end of the webinar. Um, what is uh, uh, the, you know, science horizon in embryology? What, what do, how does embryology look like in the next 10 years? Do you guys see any advancements that will change the game in embryology or is gonna continue uh, improving, but in a subtle way, the way it is right now, Tony? Um, you know, I think these the new the new push for AI. The, the, are they're just going to be tools. They're going to be tools for us to use. Um, early, you know, early in my career, we were, you know we were looking at trying to create our own algorithms. Uh, early cleavage is probably the best time to look at embryo development on day one. If it early cleaves, um, my master studies show that those are higher rates of euploidy. Um, but you know, our, my pregnancy rates have not changed a lot in the last probably 10 or 15 years. My implantation rates have gone up because we got, you know, we're getting better at selecting embryos and PGT has allowed us to select embryos uh, a little better. But even with PGT, the pregnancy rates aren't uh, 100%. So um, we're, we haven't made these huge strides. And so the idea is to be able to do more because there's going to be higher demand um, and use these tools to provide better, good care with, uh, with, um, uh, with less people, probably. Thank you so much. Marlene? You know, I'll be honest. If I never had to do another semen analysis again, <laughs> I would be a happy woman. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, if we could get automated semen analyses, Sign me up. Yeah. Awesome. Kristen? Um, I, <clears throat> well, we can do automated semen analyses if you can afford it. And I think that, you know, tools that might be coming out that would really cause major advances need to be accessible to everyone. And I think access to healthcare is a big problem in this country. And I think, you know, we don't have time lapse, for example. Um, and to be selling this as something that is going to increase your pregnancy rate or increase your euploidy rate or whatever, um, when it's not accessible to all patients, um, I don't think that that's really a good a good method of selling something for the patient. And and I think you know people can say the same thing about PGT. You know, not everyone's going to do PGT. Um, it it is quite popular in the Bay Area. Most patients are asking for PGT. Um, I, I think that has been an advance in itself. It certainly has, like Tony said, improved our implantation rates. We're doing something right because, you know, I started a little bit after Marlene and David did, but, um, you know, we used to celebrate 30% pregnancy rate and thinking it was pretty good. And now, you know, we're disappointed if we drop below 75 and, you know, we're doing something right here. So, I do see some automation coming with probably with vitrification and maybe warming. You know, I've seen some work with ICSI. Um, and as much as I think it would be nice to have non invasive PGT, you've like taken away the favorite thing I like to do every day. <laughs> you know, I love to biopsy embryos. So I think the change is inevitable. Um, but I think we need to really look at it and, and what is it really helping? Is it really helping the patient or is it like a sexy technology that, that 
looks good, you know, on your website or in a webinar kind of thing. It, it really needs to help the patient, make life easier for the embryologist, make it safer and more efficient in the lab and better for the better for everybody. Thank you so much. Any other feedback on the future of technology in embryology? Very good. So let's look at, uh, Ben, you, will you go in to say something? No, I was just acknowledging the survey. You're uh, good. Perfect. Uh, we're looking at the <clears throat> poll results. Um, we asked, do you find this webinar useful? 89% said yes. Would you like to see more webinars like this in the future? 90% yes. This is uh, uh, because of your contribution and, 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 and your valuable uh, experience, I am sure. A lot of embryologists are out there looking at you guys and they're, they're trying to learn from you and, and you are really the, the role model here. And I appreciate your feedback. Um, with this, we are coming to the end of the webinar. Um, I uh, would like to present my gratitude and appreciation for every one of you. And I will see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nabil. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Riley. Thanks, Riley. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, guys.